to all the fathers out there. Let's all stand here. We can have a little clap for the, for the dads in the room. Why not? There you go. Okay, we're going to begin to worship now, but we're going to give all the glory to our Heavenly Father this morning. So let's uh, be loud and proud this morning, guys.
song um, it is a powerful declaration of faith and trust in God it's one of the most powerful I think because it's trusting God um, so much that you can believe that he can restore even the past years that you feel you've wasted or regrets that you've got and it's saying I believe God that you can take those things and turn them into gold in my life into into good things has anyone got things from the past that they're like, I don't know how God can redeem that? And this song's like a, a faith statement. I'm going to see a victory. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. I believe that should be a declaration by the church that God can take those things that were meant for evil and use them for his kingdom purpose. Does anyone agree with me? And so we're going to sing that. I'm going to see a victory and know that this is the statement we're making. If you've got any of those years in the past that the locusts have eaten, remember that the scripture says he can restore the years the locusts have eaten. We're going to see a victory. And we declare that victory. And that is trust. It's saying, God, I trust you, even with the broken past, to take what was meant for evil and turn it to good in our lives. Now, I want to declare that again, because in my life, I want to declare that that is possible, that God can do that, that he's got that. He's got the years uh, that were eaten by the locust, and he's going to turn them to his good. So let's sing that again. I'm going to see a victory.
this morning, Lord God, that those years uh, that the enemy meant for evil, Lord, you can turn and use for your good. We declare that over this people this morning in Jesus' name. We pray that you move powerfully, Lord, to show us where you want to use past, uh, Lord, to redeem people in the future in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, welcome to Freedom, guys. Welcome. Um, we're all losing our voice a bit because yesterday we were shouting like lunatics for hours. Take a look at this to see what happened yesterday. Hi, it's Island Walk Day, and we're at the Freedom Church checkpoint. It's great to serve so many walkers coming through together. Um, uh, this morning I was like, Di, thanks so much for all you did over, over the weekend uh, to get this up and running. And Di is absolutely incredible running the event. Uh, the first thing she said to me... <laughs> first thing she said to me was, it was all team. And there was such a great showing of volunteers here from Freedom. So we genuinely want to thank you. I don't know if anyone agrees with me, but it's such an incredible event for just showing love to people in a moment of need, right? 21 miles in, having started the North Coast, that is a moment of need right there. And um, it's great that we're there as a church to show people some love. So that's, that's awesome. Um, guys, this, uh, this week coming, so this Wednesday coming, we've got a church update. And we're really going for it in the room, okay? So we'd love you to be here at 730 for church update. It doesn't sound very exciting, does it? Church update. Brilliant. I'll definitely be there for that. Um, but um, we'd love you to be. It's really part of family. We want to take a look at all that God's been doing, what we're working towards in the future, and bring you up to speed on a few really important things uh, for this next few months. So we'd love you to be here if you possibly can. If you can't possibly be here in the room, you can still stream it. But we'd really love to have the family here. So I, I don't want to put pressure on you, but if you've got a life group, we'd love you to be here as a life group. Uh, if you can make the time, 7.30 here. If you're part of a couple and you've got kids, maybe one of you can come. We'd really love that. So we'd love to see you here. Is that all good? It, it, shout, shout at me if you're coming. Both of you, brilliant. Amen. I look forward to that. Um, <clears throat> next week, uh, we've got a panel um, a discussion. So we're going to have a few of us up on the stage and we're going to be just summing up this five act. If you've been around for the last little while, we've been doing this five act um, play of scripture as N.T. Wright puts it. It's been really cool. We've loved it. Loved the study for it and, and getting into the words and looking at the story arc of the scripture and where it's brought us to as actors in this fifth act. If you've got any questions about that, we'd love to hear them. Just fire us an email anyone at freedomchurch.je, fire us an email or come and speak to us. We'd love to hear your questions. Okay, guys. And next weekend, we've, uh, sorry, in two weekends time, we've got Andrew Ollerton visiting. Um, and he, he is an incredible theologian. And he's going to take us through a really fun and creative approach to Romans. And then through July, we're going to be talking through Romans, uh, not through the whole lot because there's a lot to cover. But we're going to be opening up Romans together uh, as a church, so get ready for that. Um, is, it, is something going on today? It is. Well, I mean, we started, didn't we, with Father's Day? It is Father's Day. Um, and um, we've got um, we've got a little gift for the men in the house. And the reason I say that is because Father's Day for us isn't just about like natural fathers. It's about fathers in the house. 
So each one of us as men carries something that we pass on to younger generations of our walk with Jesus, of our experience of church and of life. And so we want to honor the men in the house today, okay, by giving them some stuff that will... Have we got, have we got those? Yeah, we've got them. Are we ready? Troops, are you ready to, to give out gifts? Find a man. Find a man that is someone over 18. And let's recognize them with a gift. And um, you go for it, you guys. Talk amongst yourselves. Here come some presents. Um, yes. Yes, don't, don't forget there's a man on stage. Guys, if you don't have one yet, put your hand up if you don't have one yet. <clears throat> Thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? I actually think it's quite hard to be a bloke these days. So I want to honor you guys if you're, if you're in there and you're grafting and you're loving your family and you're investing in the younger generations. We love you. You play such a crucial role in this church. So we welcome you as men in the house. Thank you for being men. We're gonna, we love that, we embrace that, and we appreciate it. We appreciate it massively. Um, guys, in a moment, um, kids, you've got your uh, time together where you can hear about Jesus and have fun together. Um, and so we're gonna pray for you as you go. Young people, you're staying in. Uh, and Ben is going to come speak to us. But I love to pray for our kids. Um, I love to pray for our kids and for all those who are serving them. Some who served at the Island Walk yesterday. And so we pray for energy and we pray vitality and a beautiful time together. Lord, we pray for our children. We love them. We're so grateful for them. Lord, they're arrows in the quiver. Lord, we, we know that you've blessed us with them. And so we pray today uh, that you send them up. And Lord God, that they be filled with you and that they'd know you more closely in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go for it, guys. Have a brilliant time. Thank you, all those who are serving. And we're going to welcome Ben. Say hi to someone that you don't know, and greet them with a scary Christian hug.
Hello. 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 Hi, everyone. Do come on in and have a seat if you haven't got one already. Great to have young people staying in as well. Welcome to you guys. Glad to have you here. Welcome to everyone online. I am one of those that Tim mentioned that is struggling a little bit with my voice this morning um, after shouting quite a lot yesterday. Um, I was thinking like, but I felt like it might be a bit manipulative to be like, I feel like the Lord's just calling us to a time of quiet contemplation for the next 20 minutes or so. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to preach. You might have also noticed um, on the video that um, someone rashly uh, gave me a whistle yesterday. And I think I proceeded to annoy the majority of the people at the stop for the next six hours. Um, I do need to make a public apology, I think. And probably the person's not here who I need to apologize to. But I just want to put it out there. Um, I think it was someone that was coming to um, encourage one of their relatives or friends or something. But I saw some people quite far off in the distance who were walking towards the stop. And they, to be honest, they were looking tired. Um, they were looking like they were, they were a little bit downbeat. They were trudging a little bit. And I thought, in my head, this was my inner monologue. I was like, I know how I can encourage these people. While they are still far off, I'm going to give them a massive blast on the whistle. Because they'll hear that whistle and be like, someone sees me. They know that I love them. And so I prepared, um, but I also, because I'm sensitive and aware of people around me, um, there were a couple of people standing right in front of me, so I was like, I don't want to blow the whistle right in their ears, because it was quite a shrill whistle as well. Um, so I was like, what I'll do is I'll just turn slightly to the side and blow in that direction. Um, but they're still here, because I'm going to uh, blow this whistle as loudly as I possibly can. What I didn't realize is that someone's friend or relative had sort of crept up on my right-hand shoulder, and my reaction times just weren't there yesterday. So by the time I'd committed to the whistle blast, I turned and literally right in this um, slightly older lady's face, um, blew the whistle as hard as I possibly could. Um, while my eyes sort of like widened as I was like, oh, this is really, really rude. Um, and she looked shocked. I looked shocked. Um, so I just want to apologize um, if that lady happens to hear, because that may have ruined her island walk experience. Um, but it was, it was a fun day. Um, I had a great time, and I know. Uh, that was a great highlights video as well. Micah turned that round overnight, so um, I just thought that was brilliant as well. Thank you to him. Let me pray, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Father, thank you so much for this time together. Lord, we thank you for your word, and Lord, whatever's going on in life right now, Lord, you can speak to us. And you can reassure us and you can comfort us. You can give us refreshment where we need refreshment and strength where we need strength. Perhaps courage this morning or just the ability to know that you're there. That you're walking with us every step of the way. So, Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on each and every one of us this morning. And we pray that none of us would walk away the same, Lord. We'd hear your voice this morning. And we'd walk away encouraged, challenged maybe, to live for your kingdom each and every day. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. So as Tim mentioned, we are um, coming to the conclusion of our five-act play um, series that we've been working through. We've got our slide, which will probably come up any minute now. There it is. And so if you're new to this, or perhaps you've joined halfway through the journey, um, this is just what we've been working through, and the reason we've been working through it um, comes from a quotation that we read earlier in the year that said, um, until you know the, the story that you're a part of, you will never know the character that you are called to become. I'll say that again, until you know the story that you are a part of, you will never know the character that you're called to become. And we just thought that was so relevant to being a Christian in today's day and age is that if you don't know the Christian story, if you don't know our heritage as uh, men and women, sons and daughters of God, it's really hard to know sometimes what it looks like to live in this modern world in Jersey and to be Jesus's ambassador, to live for him. What does that look like? So that's why we've been doing this. Um, and then we've made it all the way through to the final act. And we're asking these big questions of, okay, if this is the story, then what is our part? What does it look like to be God's people? here and now. And last week, Tim spoke on the value of God's people gathering. 
And um, it was a great message. I really encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to hear it last week, to go on YouTube and to hear Tim's message on the gathered, the power of the gathered people of God, because there's so much in there. And he entitled his message, Be Here. Be here. Be around God's people. Gather with God's people. Find the honey, the fruit that comes from being amongst God's people. And so today, almost as like a part two, Tim passionately spoke in that direction, the gathered. I'm going to sort of try and passionately speak in the other direction. Uh, What does it look like to be God's people scattered? So where is the value in when you're out and about? If Tim's message was called, be here, then my message is called, be there. And we're going to think about and look into scripture. And the reason that uh, it's not a typo that you just saw up there with be there is because this links with the same big analogy that we've come back to time and time again over the course of this five-act play. This idea of bees being in the hive, creating honey together, but then leaving the hive and flying out of the freedom center, which is our hive in this analogy, um, and pollinating gardens. And by that, we're talking about flourishing for the people of Jersey. When God's people are out and about, we're here to make a difference, an impact, and it's a positive impact, one that causes flourishing for people around us. There's hopefully this knowledge or joy that the community around us start to feel and experience simply because God's people are amongst them. And they are amongst them to share God's love and his message. This is what it looks like for the church to be scattered. Now today I'm not going to go into sort of the a deep dive on the theology of what it means for God's people to be like a royal priesthood or part of the body. Because we covered a lot of that last year uh, when we were in the field. We went through all of the different images of who the church are. And again, like if that's where your head's at right now, you want to understand where in Scripture uh, it talks about like being called to be out and about, to be God's people out in the workplace or in your families. We covered quite a bit of that last year, and it's still, again, all available on the website. So I want to make it more practical today. I want to talk a little bit about what it looks like and how we can practically be effective when we are God's people but scattered. You see, as we know, um, and this is just... Um, sort of rational, we can't be together all the time. This is great on a Sunday when we gather because it's exciting, it's encouraging, there is family here, there is community, but then all of us head out at the end of a Sunday service or at the end of a life group or whenever you've gathered with people. We cannot just solely be with Christians all of the time, and in fact, that's so far from who we've been designed to be. We have to be scattered. Now, sometimes we're scattered in sort of a positive, encouraging way, And that's sort of like, yes, we're leaving church on Sunday. I feel equipped, empowered. I'm going to go back into my workplace. I'm going to share God's love this week. But there's also times where sometimes we feel like we've been scattered out of our control. We might feel like, actually, I feel very isolated from other Christians. And that's not my intention. If that's you uh, this morning, then certainly you're not the first or only one. I was reading Acts recently, which is all about the early church. And in the early church, the Christians were scattered, but not of their own accord, not under their own control. In fact, the early church got ruthlessly persecuted in various different ways, and in particular from Jerusalem, where the early church was sort of exploding from. Christians were scattered away from Jerusalem because of the persecution. In Acts 8, 4, it says, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word, but they weren't scattered because they'd just decided to all go to different places. It was because of a negative reason. They had been pushed out of Jerusalem and they were running from the persecution. But whether you've been scattered positively because you're full of mission and drive or negatively and you feel like you're in a place that's out of your control that you're not enjoying, be encouraged this morning that God has a plan for you wherever you are scattered. In fact, a whole load of the New Testament is written to Christians who were scattered in various places. So there's a lot in there that can encourage us. The start of 1 Peter says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. So he's saying to those who have basically felt like they've been exiled and scattered to a different part of the world. I'm writing to you, says Peter. James is the same, the beginning of James's letter. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. He's saying, 
I know that there's a whole load of Christians out there. You've been scattered. That's what they call the dispersion. You've been dis dispersed all to different places. So I'm going to write to you and encourage you. So again, if you feel like, actually, what does it look like for me to be scattered or somewhere where there's not many other Christians around me? A lot of scripture is written to people like you, to encourage you, to help you. In fact, the theme of the gospel spreading through the scattering of God's people is a great way to look at Acts and many of the New Testament letters. The gospel moves forward when God's people are scattered. I'll say that again. The gospel moves forward when God's people are scattered. And whether it's persecution that drives us to be scattered or another reason, just the fact that we scatter from this building into our week at the end of a Sunday, the principle remains the same, that Christians are not just designed to be in here, but we are designed also to be out there. And that's what I'm going to speak and challenge and hopefully encourage you all on uh, this morning. You see, we have a stated goal as Christians. Um, that's clear, I think, from Scripture. Jesus makes it, I think, as simple um, as it can possibly be in Matthew 22, starting at verse 36. And he gets this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now this scripture is the mandate for each of us and all of us to use John's language when he was preaching on the Holy Spirit a few weeks ago. It's not something just for a generic Christian. It's something for you. It's something for me. Our mandate is to spend our lives loving God with everything that we've got. And as an overflow of that, to love our neighbors as ourselves. This is the Christian message distilled. I've heard um, an analogy used before, which I thought was quite powerful, um, a speaker that I once heard said, it's like each and every one of us with this mandate in mind has been given a unique passport. Now, a passport, we all know what a passport is. A passport is a document that gives you access to a certain nation or group of people. And if you hold the passport, you can go into that nation and you're allowed in and then you can do your business, whatever you need to do in that nation. If you hold the right passport, you can get into the nation. The passport is both a statement of identity of where you're from, but also it's like a ticket to be allowed to go somewhere. And I heard this beautiful analogy saying, as Christians, it's almost as if with this love God and love your neighbor, we've all been given this unique passport and it's a passport of the kingdom of heaven. It's Jesus's passport. It reminds us who we are and gives us our identity. But equally, each of our passports are different in, in the sense that we all have access to unique you might want to call them nations in this analogy, or unique groups of people that maybe other people do not have a passport to. Just because of the very nature of who you are, or your situation, or the job that you're in, or the people that you spend time with, you, s you can see yourself as saying, actually, I've got a passport into this group of people to be a gospel spreader. The reason that this message, I've remembered it for so long, is it was a guy who was suffer suffering from a serious debilitating disease. And through all of his suffering, and he had experienced a lot of it, he had spent time saying, God, why have you done this to me? What's going on? Like, why am I not being healed? Like all of the deepest big questions that you have if you've ever been through sickness. And he felt like one night God said to him, and he wasn't, this wasn't in any way to say that God being like, I've given you this disease. I've put you, no, no. God was just shaping his perspective in the middle of his current moment. He felt that God said to him, I've given you a passport into the community of other people that suffer with this disease. You have a unique voice and a unique ability to share my love and the gospel with these people. And that changed his perception on what God's mission was for him in that moment. And he actually became an immense advocate. He helped grow awareness for the sickness that he was suffering with um, from that moment. And he also saw many others who were suffering from that same thing come to know Jesus because of that shift in perspective and God saying to him, you've got a unique passport into that community and you have a voice in there that maybe no one else has. And I wonder today, um, as we think about the scattered and scattering, where do you have a unique passport into? 
what community of people, what family, what um, workplace might you, when you think about it, be like, actually, I've got a voice or I've got an authority or I can make an impact in this community that perhaps no one else in this room could make just because of the virtue of who I am or what my life has turned out to be. Does that make sense? You have a passport today as you walk out of here. And let me encourage you to have a think about what that is and hopefully to use it. So the title of my message, which is Be There, I've got three be theirs for you to take away today. And whatever's going on in your life right now, whether you feel like you're having a great time, you feel meaningful, full of purpose, or perhaps you feel like you're tired and exhausted and you don't want to feel like, oh, there's just more and more things that I have to now add to my list of things to do. I hope that these three be theirs. These are not extra chores in a list for us to do as Christians. I want them to feel like there's something that as wherever you're at right now, there's something that can actually help you and help you realize that you can make an impact as a Christian in any and every sphere, whether, like I say, you feel like you've been scattered positively or whether you feel like you've been scattered in a negative way and you're somewhere that you don't really want to be. Um, I wonder, I hope that these three be theirs can help you and I've tried to make them as practical as I possibly can. So the first be there for Christians scattered today is this, be there in God's presence. Be there in God's presence. John 15, this is a very well-known verse. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And I won't take that because that that last line can sound a little bit like, I don't know, aggressive or quite blunt, like Jesus being like, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I want you to hear it this morning as a release of a burden from your shoulders. Because Jesus is saying, actually, if you live from my presence, then all of this sort of the Christian life, making a difference for Jesus, making an impact, Jesus is saying, hold on, it's, it, it's not all on you to come up with all these great new ideas and new strategies as to how to change the world. Jesus is like, you make it your priority to abide in me. Because when I'm in you, you can do way more than you could ever do by yourself. And in fact, the stress and the striving will come if you try and do anything apart from me. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. This isn't a perfect analogy, but imagine, and I remember um, as a teenager, like the joy of going to a friend's house. You go and visit that friend, and you spend time with them in their presence, and it's a lot of fun. And, but there comes a point, of course, where your parents come or you've got a curfew and you've got to go home. So you leave that house again and you go back to your own home. There is a difference between visiting a friend's house and, of course, your own house. The house that you wake up in, the house that you live in, the, house that, the place that you live from. You start every day in your own environment. You wake, you're like, this is my house, this is my family, and you live from that place. So when you visit a friend, you go to that place. When you're in your own house, you're living from that place. That's the place you start. That's the place you go back to. It's your HQ. Now, I know this isn't a perfect analogy because we don't walk in and out of God's presence in any sense. But what I'm saying when I'm saying, as the scattered people of God, I want you to live from God's presence. I want you to realize that that, God's spirit within you, that is your HQ. His presence is your starting point. It's not somewhere you need to go and visit on a certain day. Does that make sense? It's a shift in thinking, and it's exactly what Jesus is saying. He's saying, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, abide in me. Make my presence your starting point. And you might be saying, okay, how do I do that? How do I live from God's presence rather than feeling like at a certain point in my day, I'm going to visit God? And there's a whole load of different ways I think you can do that. I'm a big fan, you might have heard me speak about it before, of spiritual rhythms, which is the idea of within your day, building simple, easy to follow rhythms, habits, however you want to do it, that constantly remind you or keep you attuned to the fact that God is with you. 
because it's so easy to forget. And when we forget that God is with us, that's when we can start to feel like I'm overwhelmed. What am I meant to be doing as a Christian? I'm at work. I don't know what to do. I'm so busy. I'm stressed. Whereas spiritual rhythms are the little moments in your day that just remind you, recalibrate you and say, hold on, God is with me here. The moments that remind you to pray. I've got a friend who just sets some alarms on their phone that just go off quietly in his pocket during the working day that just remind him to pray. Or sometimes he sets as the alarm a little verse that has been speaking to him recently. It's a really simple spiritual rhythm that during the day, the buzz goes off in his pocket and he remembers, I'm just going to say a quick prayer in this moment. Whatever's going on, God help me with this deal I'm in the middle of. God help me as I have this tough conversation. And it seems so simple, and yet I know from my own experience, if I don't do little things like that, I just forget. And I get to the end of the day, and I'm like, no wonder I'm feeling so stressed. I haven't even looked to God once in this day because I got too busy. Reading scripture is a classic, just spiritual rhythm that can tick over day in, day out. You don't need to feel like you're getting something from scripture every day. It's just this habit of nourishing yourself with truth and God's word, and it helps you to live from God's presence because scripture just starts to go round in your head as you spend more time in it each day. Other ways to um, recalibrate yourself, silence and solitude. I know that stuff is not always easy um, when you're so busy. Perhaps you've got kids, you don't feel like you've got a moment of silence. I'm not talking about going away and having a silent retreat for three days. It might just be two minutes where you say, right, just for two minutes, I'm going to shut off all distractions. I'm just going to have a moment of quiet. I'm going to let my soul just rest itself in Jesus once again. Um, Psalm 46, I believe it is. Be still and know that I am God. Sometimes until you've even just stopped, even for 30 seconds and been still, you forget that God is God in your situation right now. Do you see how small spiritual rhythms can help you to feel like I'm living from God's presence and abiding in him? Not like, oh my gosh, I haven't read my Bible for four days. I need to go and read two books of the Bible now to try and catch up. That's the wrong way to do it. Small but often, little tweaks, little things. 1% changes is the concept in the book Atomic Habits. These little 1% shifts that over time help you feel like, oh, in fact, my entire mindset now has shifted. God is my starting point. He's my HQ rather than the person that I go to when everything feels like it's falling apart. So as you're scattered this week, choose to be there in God's presence. Be there in God's presence. The second thing, my second be there as scattered people of God is this. Be there in your own life. Be there in your own life. I've got a reputation with my wife and others uh, for being terrible at taking hints. Um, I'll tell you the full story at some point. I don't have time today, but I never envisaged being a pastor. As some of you know, I wanted to be a lawyer for life. Very happy. I was very happy in that career. And God was really blunt and really loud with me about shifting my career from law to pastoring. Now, I initially saw that as like, how cool is that? Like, God has been so clear with me. It was an, it's, it's a good story. I'll tell you um, full one day. God's so clear with me until um, a number of people have pointed out since that maybe God had to be so clear and so blunt with me because he had been throwing hints in my direction for years previously that I had absolutely failed to even notice. And so God finally shouted in my face, essentially, be a pastor. And I was like, okay. I can be guilty of not being present. I can be distracted. I can actually miss what is going on around me because I'm somewhere else. And the more I started to think about this, the more I realized we have a culture that actually teaches us not to be present in our own life. Think about, there's so many things. Think about the idea of FOMO. The fear of missing out is the worry about I should be somewhere that I'm not. And you start, your mind space isn't where you are. It's where you're scared that maybe they're having more fun over there or they're doing more over there. And you forget the opportunities in the environment around you because you're so focused on someone or something or something else going on in um, a different place. We spend our time thinking, I'm in the wrong place. We look on social media and we compare ourselves to where everyone else is and what everyone else is doing. And we think, I wish I was there. 
Why didn't I get that opportunity? They seem to be doing so much better than I am. And I promise you, this stuff steals from us because we live a whole life that is not where we're at. We're trying and living it somewhere else. We even do it with time. Have you noticed we spend our lives either worried about the regrets of the past or the worries for the future? Again, our minds are not where we are right now. They're looking backwards constantly. They're looking forwards. And we start living anywhere but here. I read a fascinating article by a guy called Johan Hari um, who talked about how modern technology is exacerbating this effect within us. He talks about um, a professor, a French leading scientist, who um, he says in this article has studied some key factors that disrupt our attention. And she's an ex expert on the effects of chemical pollution. And she told this guy, Johan Hari, bluntly, and this is a quote, there is no way we can have a normal brain today. Because we can see the effects all around us. A small study of college students found that they now only focus on any one task for 65 seconds. A different study of office workers found that they only focus for an average of three minutes. And the conclusion of this article is this isn't happening because we all individually have become weak-willed. Your focus didn't uh, collapse, Johan Hari concludes. He says it was stolen. And he talks about a culture and a society that through everything, through technology, through is solely stealing our attention in a thousand different ways every single day. So we're ending up in this world today with FOMO, with social media, with regrets from the past, with worries from the future, living this life of comparison and our attention being quietly stolen from us through so much content every day. And without realizing, we walk so far away from what scripture encourages us to do. And 1 Corinthians 7, 17 says, Only let each person live the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. And the message translation puts it like this, which I really love for this verse. Don't be wishing that you were someplace else or with someone else. Where you are right now is God's place for you. Where you are right now is God's place for you. So I think another secret of being an effective Christian day to day is consciously striving to stay present and stay in your lane. You don't need to live someone else's life. You're not called to someone else's life. You're called to your life. What does that look like practically? Well, I think we can practice being present. I think that's actually a thing you can do this week. Perhaps you put your phone away while you're eating or working. So instead of working and then being distracted by, you know, whatever's going on um, on social media, or perhaps when you're eating with your family, if your phone is there on the table, you can see it lighting up. Your attention is constantly being stolen. You're not being present. I love this idea. I started doing a bit of research on how do you practice being present and someone suggested, allow yourself to get bored again. This was the, uh, allow yourself to get bored again. Like, and I'm an absolute, like, um, what's the word? I'm, I'm terrible at doing this. I'm standing for like two minutes. If you wait for a bus, what's happened? The phone is out. The ear pods are in. The music is on. Like, I don't allow myself to get bored. And this person that suggested, allow yourself to get bored again, was suggesting that actually a whole load of creativity comes from boredom. If you're bored, you're going to start thinking, you're going to have new ideas, you're going to strategize. But because you're never present, you never feel like you've got anything new to say, any new ideas. So practice this week being bored again. Find a moment, like challenge yourself. If you're waiting for something, if you're waiting two minutes till the microphone dings, leave the phone in the pocket. Let your mind just do some processing or some thinking. Perhaps today for you, it's just a reassurance that it is okay to run your own race. You don't need to do everything. That's the analogy of the body that Paul uses. You just need to do what God has called you to do. And that's much less stressful if you're just doing your bit and not trying to do everyone else's bit. So perhaps you need to have a think this week and say, actually, am I trying to write, run in someone else's lane? What does my lane look like? Where are my gifts and talents? Where do I get energized? Where do I feel like God is prompting me to do? You don't need to be some superhero that does everything in the church. The church is not a place for superheroes. There's only one superhero, and that's Jesus. The church is a place for a family to each say, I'm just going to play my part, and that's all I need to play. So be there in your own life this week. Choose to be present and actually do something about it. 
Like, if you feel like I'm never present, make a shift. Make a small change this week. And I promise you, for many of us, probably changing the way we use our phone is one of the first ways we can actually help ourselves in that respect. Um, I know other people that say, actually, they have a no phones in the bedroom rule. So the moment they're deciding to wind down before sleep, the phone stays downstairs. They bought an alarm clock specifically so they wouldn't use their phone as an alarm. And so the phone stays outside the bedroom. It also means it's not then the first thing that they go on when they wake up. The first thing they, is, they, they see is never like an email that's like, oh, no, stress levels go from zero to 100 because the phone's not even in the room. So by the time they've got downstairs, had breakfast, had a coffee, then they can look at their phone. It's little things, isn't it? Little things. If you want to be the scattered people of God, it's not this like huge gestures. It's just subtle tweaks. Be there in the presence of God. Be there in your own life. And my final be there is this. Be there for others. Be there for others. Philippians 2.4 says, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And I think Tim has said this before. The difference between the gathered and the scattered in this um, sense, you know, the gathered Tim talked about last week, a lot of the gathered church exists for others. It exists for the community. When we do the giveaway or we do little blessings, that's Christians gathering together for the benefit and the flourishing of the community. So what's the difference when I say be there for others when it's scattered, when you're out and about just living as a Christian? And Tim's line is this, do for the one what you can't do for everyone. Do for the one what you cannot do for everyone. You see, just as none of us could run the giveaway by ourselves, because you need a team, because there's a lot of people that come, and you need people donating clothes, and you need, none of us could do that by ourselves. That's something for the gathered to do. So the gathered needs to do for everyone what it can't do for the one. Whereas and when you're scattered, it's do for the one what you cannot do for everyone. And again, the answer is in the little things. It's a personal act of kindness. It's saying, actually, I'm going to sacrifice a bit of my time for that one person that just needs to process something or go through a conversation. There's things that we can do as individuals that it would make no sense to try and get a crowd of people to do. And that's what it looks like in the scattered. Perhaps there's a work colleague that, even though you don't know them very well, you can already tell that they're going through a hard time at the moment. And it may not be your culture in work to reach out and ask them how they're doing or ask them for a coffee. But sometimes we need to break through those boundaries. You can see that there's pain there. You can see that there's suffering. Be that little moment of light in someone's day because you've decided to be there for others. Even though there aren't any other Christians around you, you're saying, I can do something here. Sacrificing our resources for other people. Stepping into people's problems or pain or whatever it is. There's so much we can do as individuals. But again, none of us need to do these big grand gestures. It's just everyone doing these little bits and bobs, week in, week out, that builds this beautiful picture that results in flourishing for the people of Jersey. So be there in God's presence this week. Be there in your own life and be there for other people. I think if I could sum up what I want you to do this week, it's just choose to love God and to love others. Back to that simple scripture that I started with. This is all it means to be God's people scattered. A group of people that say, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, I'm going to love God with my heart, soul, body, mind, strength, and I'm going to love others. I'm going to open my eyes and look around me and care for them. And we achieve this just one choice, one moment, and one step at a time. You see, a life lived effectively for God is a culmination of thousands of little decisions rather, rather than any, any single big one. And I think sometimes as Christians, we can almost feel overwhelmed because we feel like there's so much to do, so much I need to be. I need to help here. I need to make a difference there. And I just want to, again, I want to lift that burden from your shoulders this morning and say, actually, no, no, it's just little things, a little tweak here, a little tweak there. Oftentimes, it's not adding anything to your life. It's just tweaking something that you're already doing. And that can be a real shift in mindset of like, oh, yeah, when I become a Christian, it's not like I have my life and now I have all the things I need to do as a Christian. So therefore, I have double job responsibility, basically. No, no, it's what are all the things in my own life? Now, what would it look like if I did them as a Christian? <laughs> Small tweaks. One percent shifts. So this week, choose every day to live from God's presence. Choose every day to be present in your own life and choose every day 
to put the interests of others above your own. And if you want one question that I think sums it all up and the band can come and join me, it's the timeless question that through the 90s and early 2000s was made into uh, thousands of bracelets. Uh, do you remember when these were popular? WWJD. WWJD. I mean, you know, the bracelets are gone and that's okay. But the question remains. And if you want to practically put into practice this week being the people of God but scattered, why not just add that question to everything you're doing? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Just start asking it of each decision of your life. And I promise you, you'll see some shifting and some changing. One of my favorite passages, and I'm reading on the, uh, finishing on this, sorry, is Romans 12, 9 to 21, where in a short space of time, Paul just paints this beautiful picture of what it means to be a Christian. And he's talking about the scattered. Yes, he's talking about the gathered, but he's also talking about the scattered. And I just love rereading this because it just reminds me, it's like, again, it's this um, scripture that starts going around my head that helps to tweak my decisions during the week, that helps me, again, not to add anything um, like a burden, but to just change my mindset as I walk out my Christian life day in, day out. And it just says, let love be genuine, abhor or hate what is evil, and hold fast to what is good. Love one another with a brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Don't be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in your spirit and serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation and be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty or proud, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, and so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave that to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. By doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by evil this week, but overcome evil with good, with your 1% shifts, with your little tweaks, realizing as we go out of here that we all have a responsibility to be the light, to be Jesus to those that don't know him, to share God's message. It is not down to a pastor, a team, to get God's message out there. We know that. Theologically, we covered that all of last year. It's all of our responsibility, but we can all do it. We can all do something. We're all empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I just want to encourage each and every one of you this week, make one change to your life. Just start there. One tweak. Maybe it's to do with your phone use. Maybe it's to do with saying, actually, yeah, I want to live from God's presence and not feel like I'm just visiting God every now and again. Maybe it's to do with someone that you know just needs help or love in your life. They say, actually, okay, this week I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to send a text. I'm going to give them a call. I'm going to meet them for a coffee. Because if all of us make one, then 10, then 100 little tweaks to life, and you times that by the whole community, suddenly there's thousands of tweaks then hundreds of thousands of tweaks, then millions of tweaks. And suddenly when the people of Jersey start to flourish and ask what's going on, no one person can get the glory, but everything points to Jesus. And people realize that is a community I want to be part of. Are you up for it? Then let's pray and go into worship. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to be living from your presence. And God, I just pray that everything I've just said this week, Lord, show us where we can make little tweaks to our life so that we can live effectively and fruitfully for you. Show us how to live from your presence. Teach us to be present again in our own lives and open our eyes where we can love others simply but effectively. God, just give us wisdom today, Lord. And as we worship you now to finish, 
Lord, we're just so grateful for everything you've already done in our lives, Lord. For those going through a hard time right now, I pray that you'd reach them, speak to them, refresh people this morning. We'll give you all glory and honor and praise. And everyone said, amen. Why don't we stand? Let's sing.
guys, when we come together, we, we believe that there's an opportunity to encounter God. And um, uh, earlier on, I was, I was focusing on uh, that, that line that talked about how God takes what the enemy meant for evil and turns it to good. There's an opportunity afterwards to be prayed for. As we're sitting there, I'm thinking about MacGyver. Do you, ever, do you know who MacGyver is? You know, like the all-action hero who can make anything out of anything get surrounded by enemies and trapped in a shed that's got a paper clip, a bungee rope and a bit of fluff and he makes a tank out of it and goes out and, and does incredible things. And I was thinking about MacGyver, thinking how God takes our mess and the little that we have and turns it into something powerful, okay? Like a MacGyver God, like God who takes the mess and makes something incredible take the opportunity to receive prayer today. He can take the mess, the things that you think the enemy's using for evil, and turn them to good. Don't miss an opportunity. Respond to what Ben said this morning as well. Let's go grab a coffee. Let's bless one another. Let's carry this into the spaces that you're in with your unique passport. Uh, have a great week. Thanks for being here. And um, yeah, we'll see you very soon.